Section 15 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paul Ford of PaulFord.com. The Fortunate Punishment by the Countess de Marat. Translated by James Planchet. There was once upon a time a king who fell desperately in love with a princess of his court. As soon as he loved her, he told her so. Kings are more privileged than common lovers. The princess was not offended at a love which might place her on the throne, and the king found her as virtuous as she was charming. He married her. The wedding was incredibly magnificent, and what was even more remarkable, he became a husband without ceasing to be a lover. The felicity of this love match was only disturbed by the fact of their having no children to succeed to their happiness and to their kingdom. The king, in order to obtain at least the comfort of hope on this point, resolved to consult a fairy whom he believed to be particularly friendly. She was called Formidable, although she had not always been so to the king. It is said even that in the old collections of the time in that country are to be found ballads which tell a great deal about them. So bold have poets been in all ages. For the fairy was very much respected, and appeared so stern that it was almost impossible to imagine she could ever have felt the power of love. But where are the hearts that escape? The king, who had always been very gallant and who had a great deal of discernment, was well aware that appearances are often very deceptive. He had first met with Formidable in a wood where he had been hunting. She appeared to his eyes under a form so graceful and with so charming an air that the king did not doubt for a moment her desire to please. It is seldom such charms are displayed without that intention. The king fell in love with her. The fairy felt more pleasure in being loved than in always inspiring terror. This affection lasted several years. But one day, when she reckoned on the heart of her lover as on a property it was impossible for her to lose, she let the king see her in her real form. She was no longer young or handsome. She repented immediately when she perceived by the altered expression of the king's face that she had been too confident of her power, and discovered that... However tender hearts may be, they cannot excite or retain love if they are not united with an agreeable person. The king was ashamed at finding he had been in love with only an imaginary beauty. He ceased to love the fairy, and thenceforth only treated her with attention and respect. Formidable, with a pride that was natural to her, assumed so well the appearance of being contented with the esteem of the king that she persuaded him she was one of his best friends. She even went to his wedding, in company with all the other fairies of the country, who were invited in order not to give any one reason to fancy from her refusal that she had any dislike to the marriage. The king, therefore, counting on the friendship of his old mistress, went to visit her in her residence, which was a palace of flame-coloured marble in the midst of a vast forest. The approach to it was by an avenue of immense length, bordered on both sides by a hundred flame-coloured lions. Formidable liked only this colour, and she had therefore by her magic art caused all the animals born in the forest to be of the same hue. At the end of the avenue was a large square, wherein a troop of mowers, clothed in flame colour and gold, magnificently armed, kept perpetual guard. The king traversed the forest alone. He knew the way perfectly well. He even passed through the avenue of lions without danger, for he threw them as he entered some ranunculuses, which the fairy had formerly given him to use when passing those terrible beasts. As soon as the king had thrown them those beautiful flowers, they became gentle and quiet. He at length reached the Moorish guard, who at first bent their bows at him, but the king threw them some pomegranate blossoms, which he had received from the fairy with the ranunculuses, and the moors shot their arrows into the air, and drew themselves up in line to allow him to pass. He entered the palace of Formidable. She was in a saloon, seated on a throne of rubies, in the midst of twelve moorish women, clothed in flame-coloured gauze and gold. The fairy's dress was of the same fashion and colour, but so covered with precious stones that it shone like the sun. 
yet it did not make her appear any the more beautiful. The king looked and listened for a few minutes before he entered the saloon. Near the fairy was a quantity of books on a table of red marble. He saw that she took one and began to instruct the slaves in those secrets which render fairies so powerful. But Formidable taught them none but such as would be inimical to the happiness and comfort of mankind. She took good care to prevent their learning anything that would contribute to human felicity. The king felt he hated the fairy, and entering the apartment interrupted the fatal lesson and surprised Formidable by his appearance. But recovering herself immediately, she dismissed her moors, and regarding the king with an air of pride and anger, "'What seek you here, inconstant prince?' she exclaimed. "'Wherefore do you come to disturb by your odious presence the repose I endeavour to obtain in this seclusion?' The king was quite surprised by so unexpected a mode of address, and the fairy, opening one of the books, continued, "'I see clearly what you want. Yes, you shall have a daughter by this princess whom you have so unjustly preferred to me. But do not hope to be happy. It is time for me to be avenged. The daughter that shall be born to you ere long shall be as much hated by all the world as I formerly loved you. The king did everything in his power to soften the anger of the fairy, but it was useless. Hatred had succeeded to love and nothing but love could soften the fairy's heart, for pity and generosity were sentiments quite unknown to her. She haughtily commanded the king to leave the palace, and opening a cage, a flame-coloured parrot flew out. "'Follow this bird,' said she to the king, "'and bless my clemency for not delivering you to the fury of my lions and guards.' The bird flew off, and the king followed, and was conducted by a road hitherto unknown to him, and much shorter than the one he had come by, into his own kingdom. The queen, who on his return remarked his extreme sadness, begged to know the reason so importunately that the king at length told her of the cruel prediction of the fairy, but without informing her of all that had occurred between them in former times, in order not to add to the troubles of his beautiful wife this young princess knew that one fairy could not positively prevent anything predicted by another of her own class but that she might mitigate the punishment which that other had inflicted i shall go said the queen in search of lumineurs sovereign of the happy empire she is a celebrated fairy who delights in protecting the unfortunate she is a relation of mine she has ever favoured me and she even predicted the good fortune to which love would lead me the king quite approved of the expedition of the queen, and hoped much from it. Her equipage being ready, she set off to seek lumineurs. The fairy bore this name because her beauty was so dazzling that it was hardly possible to endure the brilliancy of it, and the grandeur of her soul quite equalled her extreme loveliness. The queen arrived in a vast plain, and perceived at a great distance a large tower. But although it was in sight, it was very long before she could approach it, owing to the many windings in the road. It was built of white marble and had no doors, but arched windows of crystal. A beautiful river of which the waves appeared of liquid silver bathed the foot of the tower and wound nine times around it. The queen, with all her court, arrived on the bank of the river, at the point where it began its first circle round the dwelling of the fairy. The queen crossed it on a bridge of white poppies, which the power of lumineurs had rendered as safe and as durable as if it had been built of brass. But although it was only made of flowers, it was nevertheless to be feared, for it had the power of putting people to sleep for seven years who attempted to pass it contrary to the wish of the fairy. The queen perceived on the other side of the bridge six young men, magnificently attired, sleeping on beds of moss under tents of foliage. These were princes enamoured of the fairy, and as she never would hear love spoken of, she had not allowed them to pass any farther. The queen, after having crossed the bridge, found herself in the first spot which the river left free. It was occupied by a charming labyrinth of laurestinus and jasmine. There were none but white, for that was the colour lumineurs preferred, 
After having admired this lovely maze, and easily threaded its paths, which were only difficult for those the fairy did not wish should enter her agreeable dwelling, the queen again crossed the river by a bridge of white anemones. It took at this place its second turn, and the space which it left before it made its third circle was occupied by a forest of acacias always in full bloom. The roads through it were charming and so overshadowed that the rays of the sun never penetrated. A number of white doves whose plumage might have put the snow to shame were seen in all directions, and the trees were covered with countless white canary birds that made a delicious concert. Lumineuse, with a touch of her wand, had taught them the most beautiful and charming songs in the world. They left this lovely forest by a bridge of tube roses, and they then entered a fair plain wooded with trees laden with such fine and delicious fruit that the least of them would have put to shame the famous gardens of the Hesperides. Every evening the queen found the most beautiful tents in the world prepared for her, and a magnificent repast was served as soon as she arrived without her seeing any of the skilful and active officers who prepared it. The fairy, who had learnt by her books of the arrival of the queen, took care that her journey should not be in the least degree fatiguing to her. The queen, leaving this marvellous spot, passed the river again by a bridge of white pinks and entered the park of the fairy. It was as beautiful as all the rest. The fairy sometimes came to hunt there. It was filled with an infinite number of white stags and does, with other animals of the same colour. A pack of white greyhounds were scattered over the park, and lying on the turf with the deer and white rabbit, and other animals usually wild, but they were not so in this place. The art of the fairy had tamed them, and when the dogs chased some beast for the amusement of luminaires, it appeared as if they understood it was only in play for while they hunted it in the best style, they never did the animal any harm. In this place, the river made its fifth circuit round the dwelling of the fairy. The queen, in quitting the park, crossed the water on a bridge of white jasmine, and found herself in a charming hamlet. All the little cottages were built of alabaster. The inhabitants of this pleasant place were subjects of the fairy, and tended her flocks. Their garments were of silver gauze, they were crowned with chaplets of flowers, and their crooks were brilliantly studded with precious stones. All the sheep were of surprising whiteness. All the shepherdesses were young and handsome, and luminaires loved the colour of white too well to have forgotten to bestow on them a complexion so beautiful that even the sun itself seemed to have only helped to render it more dazzling. All the shepherds were amiable, and the sole fault that could be found with this agreeable country was that there was not a single brunette to be seen there. The shepherdesses came to receive the queen, and presented her with porcelain vases filled with the most beautiful flowers in the world. The queen and all her court were charmed with their agreeable journey, and drew from it a happy presage of obtaining what she desired of the fairy. As she was about to leave the hamlet, a young shepherdess advanced towards the queen, and presented her with a little white greyhound on a cushion of white velvet embroidered with silver and pearls. It was hardly possible to distinguish the dog from the cushion, the colour was so exactly the same. "'The fairy lumineuse, sovereign of the happy empire,' said the young shepherdess to the queen, "'has commanded me to present you in her name with Blanc Blanc, which is the name of this little greyhound.' She has the honour of being beloved by Lumineuse, whose art has made a marvel of her, and who has commanded her to conduct you to the tower. You will have nothing to do, princess, but let her go and follow. The queen received the little dog with much pleasure, and was charmed at the attentions shown her by the fairy. She caressed Blanc Blanc, who, after having returned her endearments with much intelligence and grace, jumped lightly to the ground and began to frisk before the queen who followed her with all her court. They arrived at the bank of the river, which there made its sixth turn, and were surprised to find no bridge by which to cross it. The fairy did not wish to be troubled by the shepherds in her retreat, so there was never a bridge at that point, except when she desired herself to pass or to receive any of her friends. The queen was pondering on this adventure, when she heard Blanc Blanc bark three times, 
Immediately, a light breeze agitated the trees on the banks of the river and shook from them such a great quantity of orange flowers into the water that they formed a bridge of themselves, and the queen crossed the river by it. She rewarded Blanc Blanc by caresses, and found herself in an avenue of myrtles and orange trees, which having traversed without any feeling of fatigue, although it was an immense length, she found herself again on the bank of the river, which made its seventh turn at that spot. She saw no bridge, but the adventure of the morning reassured her. Blanc Blanc struck the ground three times with her little paw, and in a moment there appeared a bridge of white hyacinths. The queen crossed it and entered a meadow enamelled with flowers. Her beautiful tents were already pitched in it. She rested a short time and then resumed her journey, till she again found herself on the bank of the river. There was again no means of crossing it, but Lonk Blanc advanced and drank a little of the beautiful stream, whereupon a bridge of white roses appeared, and the queen was thereby enabled to enter the garden of the fairy. It was so filled with wonderful flowers, extraordinary fountains, and statues of superior beauty, that it is impossible to give an exact description of it. If the queen had not felt the utmost impatience to avert the evils with which the cruel formidable menaced her, she would have lingered some time in this charming place. All the court left it with regret, but they were obliged to follow Blanc Blanc, who conducted the queen to the spot where the river made its last circuit round the dwelling of Lumineurs. The queen then saw the palace of the fairy quite near to her, nothing but the river divided her from it she gazed on it with pleasure as the goal of her journey and read this inscription written on the tower in letters of gold of perfect bliss behold the charming seat but lumineurs to pleasure dedicated love only may not enter this retreat although it would seem for love alone created this inscription had been composed in honour of Lumineurs by the most celebrated fairies of her time. They had wished to leave to posterity the expression of their friendship and esteem for her. Whilst the Queen thus amused herself on the banks of the river, Blanc Blanc swam across the stream, and diving brought up a shell of Mother of Pearl, which she again let fall into the water. At this signal, six beautiful nymphs in brilliant attire opened a large crystal window, and a staircase of pearls issued from it and slowly approached the queen. Blanc Blanc ran up it quickly, till the arrival at the window of the fairy, and entered the tower. The queen followed, but as she ascended, the steps of the pretty staircase which she had mounted disappeared behind her, and prevented anyone else from following her. She entered the beautiful tower of Lumineurs, and the window was immediately closed. All the suite of the queen were in despair when they lost sight of her, and found they were unable to follow, for they loved her most sincerely. Their lamentations were heard even in the place where Lumineurs conversed with the queen, and in order to reassure these unfortunates, the fairy sent one of her nymphs to conduct them to the hamlet where they could await the return of the queen. The staircase of pearls reappeared and revived their hopes. The nymph descended, and the queen from the window commanded them to follow and obey the messenger. The queen remained with the fairy, who entertained her with prodigious magnificence and with a charm of manner which won all hearts. The queen stayed with her for three days, which were not sufficient, however, for the inspection of all the marvels of the Tower of Lumineurs. It would have taken centuries to see and admire everything which the fairy had to show. The fourth day, Lumineurs, after having laden the queen with presents as elegant as they were magnificent, said to her, "'Beautiful princess, I am sorry not to be able to repair the misfortune with which Formidable threatens you. But that is the fault of destiny, which allows us to bestow good gifts on those whom we favour, but forbids us to undo or avert the evils inflicted by other fairies. However, to console you for the misfortune that has been predicted for you, 
I promise that before a year be over you shall have a daughter so beautiful that all those who behold her shall be enchanted with her. And I will take care, added the fairy, to cause a prince to be born who shall be worthy of her hand. So favourable a prophecy made the queen forget for a time the hatred of Formidable and the misfortune she had threatened her with. Luminurs did not tell the queen the reason of Formidable being her enemy. Fairies, even when they quarrel amongst themselves, keep jealously secret everything which would render them contemptible in the eyes of mortals. And tis said they are the only women who have the generosity not to speak ill of one another. After a thousand thanks on the part of the queen, Luminurs ordered twelve of her nymphs to take charge of the presents and to conduct the queen to the hamlet she herself accompanying her as far as the staircase of pearls which appeared as soon as they opened the window when the queen and nymphs were at the foot of the stairs they saw a silver car drawn by six white hinds the harness was covered with diamonds a young child lovely as the day drove the car and the nymphs followed on white horses which might have vied in beauty with those of the sun in this eloquent equipage the queen arrived at the hamlet she there found all her court, who were rejoiced to see her again. The nymphs then took leave of the queen and presented her with the twelve beautiful animals enchanted by the fairy, so that they were never tired, informing her that Luminers begged she would offer them in her name to the king. The queen, overwhelmed by the kindness of the fairy, returned to her kingdom. The king met and received her at the frontier. He was so charmed at her return and her agreeable news which she announced on the part of Luminers that he ordered public rejoicings, the renown of which reached the ear of former Dable, and thereby redoubled her hate and anger against the king. Soon after the return of the queen she found she was about to become a mother and felt assured that the beautiful princess who was to charm all hearts would be ere long presented to the king by her. For Luminers had promised her birth should take place before the end of the year, and Formidable had not prescribed the time when her vengeance should be accomplished. But she had no idea of postponing it long. The queen gave birth to two princesses, and did not doubt for a moment which was the daughter promised to her by Luminers from the eagerness she felt to embrace the one which first saw the light. She found her quite worthy of the praises of the fairy. Nothing in the world could be so beautiful. The king and all who were present hastened to admire the first-born little princess, and they entirely forgot the other. But the queen, judging by the general neglect that the prediction of Formidable was also accomplished, gave orders several times that the same care should be taken of her as of the eldest. The waiting women obeyed with a repugnance which they could not overcome, and for which the king and queen dared scarcely blame them, as they felt the same themselves. Luminers arrived with all speed upon a cloud and named the beautiful princess M.A., significant of the destiny which she had promised her. The king paid Luminers all the respect she deserved. She promised the queen always to protect M.A., but she bestowed on her no gift, for she had already given her all in her power. As for the other princess, it was in vain that the king gave her the name of one of his provinces. Insensibly, everyone accustomed themselves to call her Neme, in cruel contradistinction to her sister Emme. When the two princesses had attained the age of twelve years, Formidable desired them to be sent away from the court, in order, as she said, to diminish the love and the hate which they inspired. Luminers let Formidable have her way. She was sure that nothing would prevent the beautiful Emme from reigning in the kingdom of her father and in the hearts of his subjects. She had endowed her with such charms that no one could see her and have any doubt about it. The king, in the hope of appeasing the hatred of Formidable, which extended to all his family, resolved to obey her. He therefore sent the two young princesses, with a youthful and agreeable court, to a marvellous castle which he possessed in a remote part of his empire. It was called the Castle of Portraits, and was a place worthy of the learned fairy who had built it four thousand years before. 
The gardens and all the promenades surrounding it were lovely, but the most remarkable thing was the gallery of immense length, which contained portraits of all the princes and princesses of the blood royal of that and all the neighbouring countries. As soon as they attained their fifteenth year, their portraits were placed here, painted with an art which could be but feebly imitated by any but a fairy. This custom was to be observed until the time when the most beautiful princess in all the world should enter the castle. This gallery was divided into two vast and magnificent apartments. The two princesses occupied them. They had the same masters, the same education, they taught nothing to the charming Aimé which was not also taught to her sister. But Formidable came and instilled lessons into the latter which spoilt all the rest while Lumineuse, on her side, rendered Aimé, by her instructions, worthy of the admiration of the whole universe. After the princesses had been in this castle, excluded from the court for three years, they heard one day a strange noise, which was followed by the sound of charming music. They looked about everywhere to find from whence the noise and the concert proceeded when they perceived three portraits occupying three places which a moment before had been vacant. The first represented a lady being crowned by two cupids with flowers, one of whom regarded the beautiful portrait with all the attention it merited, and seemed to have forgotten to let fly an arrow at it which was fixed in his bent bow. The other held a little streamer, on which were these verses. Aimé received from nature at her birth those beauties which immortal are alone, the graces added loveliness to worth, and Venus yielded up to her her zone. It was not necessary to announce this as the portrait of the beautiful M.A. One saw in it all her features depicted with that charming grace which attracted every heart. She had an exquisitely fair complexion, the most beautiful colour in the world, a round face, lovely light hair, blue eyes, which shone with so much brightness that those who had the pleasure of seeing them thought it useless that Lumineuse should have bestowed on Aimé a gift which she was sure of possessing from her own personal beauty. Her mouth was charming, her teeth as white as her skin, and Venus seemed to have given her the power of smiling like herself. It was this divine portrait which occupied the end of the gallery. The second was that of Neme. She was fair and did not want beauty, but notwithstanding, like the original, the portrait failed to please. These words were inscribed beneath it in letters of gold. Neme, of more than common charms possessed, can in no mortal heart a dwelling find. Learn that in vain we are with beauty blessed wanting the rarer graces of the mind. These two portraits occupied all the attention of the two princesses and of their juvenile court. When Aimé, who was not proud of her own personal charms, and leaving to the others the task of admiring them, turned her eyes towards the third portrait, which had appeared at the same time with her own, she found it well worth looking at. It was that of a young prince, a thousand times handsomer than Cupid himself, he had more the air of a god than a mortal. His black hair fell in large curls on his shoulders, and his eyes bespoke as much intelligence as his person displayed manly beauty. These words were written underneath the portrait. This is the prince of the pleasant island. Its beauty surprised everybody, but it affected the lovely Aimé particularly. Her young heart experienced an unknown emotion, and Neme even, at the sight of this handsome portrait, found she was not exempt from a passion which she could not herself inspire. The adventure itself did not so much astonish anyone, for they were accustomed to see wonderful things in that country. The king and queen came to the castle to visit the princesses, and had a great many copies made of their portraits, which they sent to all the neighbouring kingdoms. But Aimé, as soon as she was alone, carried away by an involuntary impulse, returned to the gallery of portraits, where that of the prince of the pleasant island engrossed all her attention, and was every way worthy of it. Neme, who had nothing in common with her sister save an equal admiration of the portrait of the prince, also passed nearly all her time in the gallery. This growing passion so increased the hatred of Neme for her sister, 
that not being able herself to injure her, she incessantly implored the fairy Formidable to punish her for possessing superior charms. The cruel fairy never neglected an opportunity of doing harm, so, following her own inclination, while yielding to the solicitations of Neme, she went in search of the amiable princess, who was walking on the bank of the river which flowed at the foot of the castle of portraits. Go, said Formidable to her, touching her with an ebony wand which she carried in her hand. Go, follow continually the winding of this river, until the day when thou shalt meet a person who hates thee more than I do, and until that hour thou shalt not stop to rest in any place in the world. The princess, at this terrible order, began to weep. Such tears! In all the universe, no heart but that of Formidable could be found incapable of being softened by them. Lumineuse hastened to the assistance of the beautiful and unhappy Aimé. Be comforted, said she. The journey to which Formidable has condemned thee shall terminate in a delightful adventure, and during it thou shalt have nothing but pleasure. Aimé, after this favourable prediction, departed with one single regret, which was that she should see no more the beautiful portrait of the Prince of the Pleasant Island. But she dared not express her sorrow to the fairy. She therefore set out on her journey, and everything appeared sensible of her charms. None but the gentlest airs breathed in the places through which she passed. Everywhere she found nymphs ready to wait on her with the utmost respect, the meadows were covered with flowers at her approach, and when the sun became too powerful, the trees increased their foliage to protect her from its beams. While the beautiful princess made so pleasant a journey, Lumineuse did not merely limit her exertions to neutralising the evil designs of Formidable. She sought Neme, and striking her with an ivory wand, Be gone, said she. Follow in thy turn the banks of the river, and never shalt thou rest until thou shalt find a person who loves thee as much as thou deservest to be hated. Neme departed, and no one regretted her absence. Even Formidable, who was always well pleased when she caused pain, thought no more of Neme, and did not condescend to protect her any longer. The two princesses thus continued their journey. Neme, with all the fatigue possible, the most beautiful flowers changing into thorns in her path, and the lovely princess, with all the pleasures which Lumineuse had led her to hope for, indeed she found them still greater than she had expected. At the close of a beautiful day, at the hour when the sun sank to rest in the arms of Theatis, Aimé seated herself on the bank of the river. Immediately an infinite number of flowers springing up around her formed a sort of couch, the charms of which she would have admired for a much longer time had she not perceived an object on the river which prevented her from thinking of anything else. It was a little boat made of amethyst, ornamented with a thousand streamers of the same colour, inscribed with ciphers and gallant devices. Twelve young men, clothed in light garments of grey and silver, crowned with garlands of amaranths, rowed with so much diligence that the boat was very soon sufficiently close to the shore to allow a maid to remark its various beauties. It was with a feeling of agreeable surprise that she perceived on every part of it her name and her initials. A moment after, the princess recognised her portrait upon a little altar of topaz raised in the centre of the boat and beneath the portrait she read these words, If this be not love, what is it? After the first emotion of surprise and admiration, she feared to see the stranger land who appeared to be so very gallant. Everything informs me of the love of an unknown admirer, said Aimé to herself, but I feel that the Prince of the Pleasant Island is alone worthy to inspire me with that sentiment which I too plainly perceive is entertained for me by another. Fatal portrait, she exclaimed. Why did destiny present it to my view at a time when, so far from defending myself from its influence, I was even ignorant that it was possible to love anything more tenderly than flowers? This reflection was followed by many sighs, and she would have remained longer buried in her sweet reverie if the agreeable sound of diverse instruments had not roused her from it. 
she looked towards the boat from whence these pleasing sounds proceeded. A man, whose face she could not see, clothed in a robe of that same magnificent colour which was displayed in his entire equipage, appeared to be entirely occupied in the contemplation of her portrait, whilst six beautiful nymphs formed a charming concert and accompanied these words, which were sung by him who did not take his eyes off the picture of the princess. The air was dubelize let all things witness to my passion bear and vaunt the beauties of my matchless fair and may more charms than venus self displays ye nymphs in turn your tuneful voices raise let all things witness to my passion bear and vaunt the beauties of my matchless fair the graces gladly quit the queen of love to follow one whose smile far more they prize to see and serve her is a bliss above all that the gods can offer in the skies a may more charms a may more charms one glance from her sweet eyes my heart subdued all yield to her all to her empire bow until the moment man her beauty viewed none could have loved as all the world must now a may more charms a may more charms the sweetness of the music detained the beautiful a on the bank of the river when it was finished the stranger turned his face towards her and enabled her to recognise, with as much confusion as pleasure, the agreeable features of the Prince of the Pleasant Island. What a surprise, what joy to see this charming prince, and to find he thought of nothing but her. One must know how to love as they did in the days of the fairies, to understand all that the young princess felt. The Prince of the Pleasant Island was equally astonished. He hastened to land on the fortunate shore which presented to his view the divine Aimé. She had not the heart to fly from so perfect a prince, though she upbraided fate a thousand times for her own weakness. On such occasions fate generally bears the blame. It is impossible to express what the young lovers said to each other. Often, indeed, they understood each other without speaking. Lumineurs who had conducted to this place both the pretty boat and the steps of Aimé, appeared all at once to reassure the timid princess, who had at length made up her mind to avoid so charming and dangerous a prince. She told them that they were destined to love each other, and to be for ever united. But, added the fairy, before this happy time arrives, you must finish the journey commanded by Formidable. It is impossible to disobey the fairies. So the beautiful Aimé and the prince were satisfied with the pleasure of being together, and felt that anything which did not separate them was only too delightful. They continued, therefore, their route, sometimes in the pretty boat, sometimes wandering on foot through a vast but beautiful wilderness which the river fertilised with its waters. It was in this tranquil seclusion that the prince of the pleasant island completely lost his peace of mind. He informed the beautiful princess of all he had felt for her since the happy day when her divine portrait had been brought to his court, and that one morning, as he was walking on the banks of the river and dreaming of her, Lumineurs had appeared, and showing him the amethyst boat, commanded him to embark in it, promising him success in his voyage and a favourable issue to his love. Whilst the prince and the beautiful Aimé obeyed the orders of Formidable, their affection increased each day. They became so happy that they dreaded arriving at the end of their journey, for fear of being occupied with anything else but their love. Neme, meanwhile, also continued her painful progress. The course of the river which the two princesses followed conducted them insensibly to the pleasant island, and they arrived there exactly at the same moment. Lumineuse did not fail to be present also. She informed Aimé that the revenge of Formidable was accomplished, because in meeting her sister she had found the only person in the world who could hate her. "'And the journey of Neme is also finished, then,' said the beautiful princess, "'for nothing has been able to diminish my regard for her.' She then begged the fairy to mitigate, if possible, the sad fate of her sister, but this favour was useless to Neme. The moment she saw the Prince of the Pleasant Island, whom she recognised easily as the original of the exquisite portrait which had touched her heart, and heard him tell Lumineuse that the time of his marriage with a May approached, she threw herself into that river, the course of which she had followed for twelve months with so much pain, yet without having resorted to self-destruction. But the woes of love affect us more deeply than any other misfortunes. 
Lumineuse, who saw the princess plunge into the water, changed her into a little animal, which evinces still by its manner of walking the contrariness of the unhappy Nemei. Her fate followed her even after her death, for she was not regretted. It cost Nemei, however, a few tears. But what troubles could not be consoled by the prince of the pleasant island? She was so engrossed by his affection that she cared but little for the fates which they gave to celebrate her arrival in the kingdom, and the prince himself took but a trifling share in them. When one is really in love, there is no true pleasure but that of being loved in return. The king and queen, apprised by luminaires of what had occurred, hastened to rejoin their amiable daughter, and in their presence the generous fairy declared that the lovely May had had the honour of putting an end to the adventure of the castle of portraits, because nothing had ever appeared so beautiful as herself in all the world. The love of the prince of the pleasant island was too violent to endure delay, so he begged the king and queen to consent to the fulfilment of his happiness. Luminaires herself honoured with her presence a day so fair and so much desired, the nuptials were celebrated with all the magnificence which might be expected from fairies and kings. But happy as was the day, I will not attempt a description of it, for, however agreeable to the lovers themselves, a wedding is almost always a dull affair to the general company. While love in turn upon the tender strings of human hearts with hope and fear can play, lovers and poets have a thousand things more or less sweet and eloquent to say, but soon as entered Hymen's happy state, Apollo and the muses all seemed dumb. Of author and of husband tis the fate to fail in an epithalamium. End of section 15「Section 16 of Four and Twenty Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Fairer Than a Fairy by Mademoiselle de la Force. Translated by James Blanche. Part 1. There was once upon a time in Europe a king, who having already several children by a princess whom he had married, took it into his head to travel from one end of his kingdom to the other. He passed his time in visiting one province after another very pleasantly, but while he was staying in a beautiful castle at the extremity of his dominions, the queen, his wife, was brought to bed there of a daughter, who appeared so exceedingly lovely at the moment of her birth, that the courtiers, either on account of the child's beauty, or to ingratiate themselves with the parents, named her her fairer than a fairy and it will be seen how well she merited so illustrious a title the queen had scarcely recovered when she was obliged to follow the king her husband who had departed in haste to defend a distant province which his enemies had invaded little fairer than a fairy was left behind with her governess and the ladies who attended on her they brought her up with the utmost care and as her father was involved in a long and cruel war, she had plenty of time during his absence to increase in stature and beauty. That beauty rendered her famous in all the surrounding countries. Nothing else was spoken of, and at twelve years old, she might more easily be taken for a divinity than for a mortal. One of her brothers came to see her during a truce, and conceived the most perfect affection for her. Meanwhile, however, the fame of her beauty and the name she bore so irritated the fairies against her that there was nothing they did not think of to revenge themselves on her for the presumption implied by such a title and to destroy a beauty of which they were so jealous the queen of the fairies was not one of those good fairies who are the protectors of virtue and who have no pleasure but in doing good many centuries have elapsed since she had attained royalty by her profound learning and art her great age had caused her to dwindle in stature and she was now only called by the nickname of nabat nabat accordingly summoned a council and made known to them her resolution to avenge not only the beauties of her own court but those of the entire world that she had determined to go and see for herself and carry off this paragon whose reputation was so injurious to their charms it was no sooner said than done she set out and clothed in a very plain garb transported herself to the castle which contained this marvellous creature 
she soon made herself at home in it and induced by her cunning the ladies of the princess to receive her amongst them but nabot was struck with astonishment when after having carefully examined the castle she discovered by means of her art that it had been constructed by a great magician and that he had endowed it with a virtue by the power of which no one could leave its walls or the surrounding pleasure grounds but of their own free will and that it was not possible to use any sort of enchantment against those persons who inhabited it this secret was not unknown to the governess of fairer than a fairy who well aware of the invaluable treasure committed to her charge still felt no alarm on her account knowing that no one in the world could take from her this young princess so long as she should not go outside the castle or the gardens she had expressly forbidden her to do so and fairer who had already a large share of discretion had never failed in taking this precaution a thousand lovers had made fruitless efforts to carry her off but knowing herself secure within those limits she did not fear their violence the boat did not require much time to insinuate herself into her good graces she taught her to do beautiful kinds of work and rendered her lessons agreeable by recounting pleasant stories she neglected nothing which could divert her and naturally pleased her so much that at length one was never seen without the other amidst all her attentions however nabot was not less occupied with her schemes of revenge she sought for an opportunity of inducing fairer than a fairy by some cunning pretense only to put her foot over the threshold of one of the castle gates she was always prepared to pounce on and fly away with her one day that she had led her into the garden and the young maidens of her court having gathered some flowers had crowned with them the beautiful head of fairer than a fairy nabot opened a little door which led into the fields and passing out at it played an hundred antics which caused the princess and the young folks who surrounded her to laugh heartily all at once the wicked nabot pretended to be taken ill and the next minute she fell down as if swooning away some of the young maidens ran to assist her and fairer flew also to her side but hardly had the unhappy child passed the fatal gate than nabot sprang up seized her with a powerful arm and making a circle with her wand a thick black fog arose which dispersing again almost immediately the ground was seen to open and two moles emerged with wings formed of rose leaves drawing an ebony car and nabot placing herself in it with fairer than a fairy it ascended into the air and cleaving it with incredible velocity disappeared entirely from the sight of the young maidens who by their cries and tears soon announced to all the castle the loss they had sustained fairer than a fairy only recovered from her first astonishment to fall into another still more fearful the rapidity with which the car passed through the air had so bewildered her that she almost lost consciousness at length reviving a little she cast down her eyes what was her alarm to find nothing beneath her but the vast extent of the shoreless ocean she uttered a piercing cry turned round and seeing near her her dear nabot she embraced her tenderly and held her close in her arms as one naturally would to reassure oneself but the fairy repulsed her rudely off audacious child said she behold in me your mortal foe i am the queen of the fairies and you are about to pay to me the penalty of your insolence in assuming the proud name which you bear fair trembling at these words more than if a thunderbolt had fallen at her feet felt greater alarm at them than at the dreadful road she was travelling at length however the car alighted in the midst of the magnificent courtyard of the most superb palace that ever was seen the sight of so beautiful a palace somewhat reassured the timid princess especially when she descended from the car and she saw an hundred young beauties who came with much deference to pay their respects to the fairy so charming a residence did not appear to announce misfortune to her she had also one consolation which does not fail to flatter one in similar situations she remarked that all those beautiful persons were struck with admiration on beholding her and she heard a confused murmur of praise and envy which gratified her marvellously 
but how speedily was this little feeling of vanity extinguished nabot imperiously commanded them to strip fairer of her beautiful clothes thinking thereby to take from her a portion of her charms they pulled them off accordingly but only to increase the fury of nabot for what beauties were then disclosed to view and to what shame did they put all the fairies in the world they reclothed her in old shabby garments but in this state one would have said her natural and simple loveliness was determined to show how independent it was of the assistance of the most costly ornaments never did she appear more charming nabot then ordered them to conduct her to the place which she had prepared for her and to set her her task two fairies took her and made her pass through the most beautiful and sumptuous apartments that could possibly be seen fairer noticed them in spite of her misery and said to herself whatever torments they may prepare for me my heart tells me i shall not always be miserable in this beautiful palace they made her descend a large staircase of black marble which had more than a thousand steps she thought she was going into the bowels of the earth or rather that they were conducting her into the infernal regions at length they entered a small cabinet wainscoted with ebony where they told her she would have to sleep on a little straw and that there was an ounce of bread with a cup of water for her supper from thence they made her pass into a great gallery the walls of which were entirely composed of black marble and which had no light but that afforded by five lamps of jet which threw a sombre glare over the place more alarming than cheering these gloomy walls were hung with cobwebs from top to bottom and such was their peculiarity that the more they were swept away the more they multiplied the two fairies told the princess that this gallery must be swept clean by break of day or that she would be made to suffer the most frightful torments and after placing a ladder and giving her a broom of rushes they bade her set to work and left her fairer than a fairy sighed and not knowing the peculiarity of those cobwebs courageously resolved notwithstanding the great length of the gallery to execute the task imposed on her she took her broom and mounted the ladder nimbly but oh heavens what was her surprise when as she endeavoured to sweep the marble and clear off the cobwebs she found they increased in proportion to her exertions she fatigued herself by persevering for some time but perceiving sorrowfully at length that it was all in vain she threw down her broom descended the ladder and seating herself on the last step of it began to weep bitterly and to foresee the extent of her misfortune her sobs came at length so fast that she could no longer support herself when raising her head a little her eyes were dazzled by a brilliant light the gallery was in an instant illuminated from end to end and she saw kneeling before her a youth so beautiful and charming that at the first glance she took him for cupid but she remembered that love is always painted naked and this handsome youth was dressed in a suit of clothes covered with jewels she was not sure also that all the light she perceived did not proceed from his eyes so beautiful and brilliant did they appear to her this young man continued to gaze upon her she felt inclined to kneel too who art thou she exclaimed in amazement art thou a god art thou love i am not a god he replied but i have more love in me than is to be found in heaven or earth beside i am Ferris, son of the queen of the fairies who loves you and will aid you then taking up the broom which she had thrown down he touched all the cobwebs which immediately turned to cloth of gold of marvellous workmanship the lamps becoming bright and shining Ferris then giving a golden key to the princess said in the principal panel of your cell you will find a lock open it gently adieu i must retire for fear of being suspected go to rest you will find all that is necessary for your repose then placing one knee on the ground he respectfully kissed her hand and disappeared fairer more surprised at this adventure than at anything else which had happened to her during the day re-entered her little apartment and looked about for the lock of which he had spoken when on approaching the wainscot she heard the most gentle voice in the world apparently deploring some misfortune and she imagined it must proceed from some wretched being persecuted as she was she listened attentively alas what shall i do said the voice they bid me change this bushel of acorns into oriental pearls fairer than a fairy less astonished than she would have been two hours before 
struck two or three times on the panel and said pretty loudly if they impose hard tasks in this place miracles are at the same time performed here therefore hope but tell me i pray who you are and i will tell you who i am it is more agreeable to me to satisfy your curiosity than to continue my employment replied the other person i am the daughter of a king they say i was born charming but the fairies did not assist at my birth and you know they are cruel to those whom they have not taken under their protection directly they come into the world ah i know it too well replied fair i am handsome like yourself the daughter of a king and unfortunate because i am agreeable without the assistance of their gifts we are then companions in misfortune returned the other but are you in love not far from it said fairer in a low voice but continue your story said she aloud and do not question me more i was considered continued the other the most charming creature that had ever existed and everybody loved me and wished to possess me they called me de Sirs. my will was law and i was treasured in all hearts a young prince the most enthusiastic of my adorers abandoned everything for me my encouragement of his hopes transported him with delight we were about to be united for ever when the fairies jealous at beholding me the object of universal admiration and detesting the sight of attractions which they had not bestowed carried me off one day in the midst of my triumphs and consigned me to this horrid place they have threatened that they will strangle me to-morrow morning if i have not performed a preposterous task which they have imposed upon me now tell me quickly who are you i have told you all replied fairer but my name they call me fairer than a fairy you must then be very beautiful replied the princess the sirs i should like excessively to see you i am quite as anxious to see you replied fairer is there a door hereabouts for i have a little key which perhaps may be of use to you looking narrowly round she discovered one which she was able to open and pushing it the two princesses met face to face and were equally surprised at the marvellous beauty of each other after embracing affectionately and saying many civil things to one another fairer began to laugh at seeing the princess the sirs continually rubbing her acorns with a little white stone as she had been ordered to do she told her of the task which they had imposed upon her and how miraculously she had been assisted by a charming unknown being but who can it be said the princess de sirs i think it is a man replied fairer a man cried de sirs you blush you love him no not yet replied fairer but he has told me he loves me and if he loves me as he says he shall assist you hardly had she uttered these words when the bushel measure began to shake and agitating the acorns as the oak on which they had grown might have done they were instantly changed into the most beautiful pear-shaped pearls of the first water it was one of these which cleopatra dissolved in wine at the costly banquet she made for mark antony the two princesses were delighted at the exchange and fairer than a fairy who began to be accustomed to wonders leading de Sirs by the hand returned into her own chamber and finding the panel containing the lock of which the stranger had spoken she opened it with her golden key and entered an apartment the magnificence of which both surprised and affected her as she saw in everything it contained the attention of her lover it was strewn with the most beautiful flowers and exhaled a divine perfume at one end of this charming room there was a table covered with all that could gratify the most refined taste and two fountains of liqueurs which flowed into basins of porphyry the young princesses seated themselves in two ivory chairs enriched with emeralds they ate with a good appetite and when they had supped the table disappeared and in its place arose a delicious bath into which they stepped together at a few paces from them they observed a superb toilet table and large baskets of gold wire full of linen of such exquisite purity that it made them long to make use of it a bed of singular form and extraordinary richness occupied the further end of this marvellous chamber which was lined with orange trees and golden boxes studded with rubies while rows of cornelian columns sustained the sumptuous roof divided only by immense crystal mirrors which reached from the ground to the ceiling several consoles of rare materials supported vases of precious stones filled with all sorts of flowers 
the princess de Sures admired the good fortune of her companion and turning to her observed your lover is indeed gallant he can do much and he will do everything for you your happiness is extraordinary a clock striking midnight repeated at each stroke the name of ferris fairer than a fairy colored and threw herself on the couch she trusted to repose but her sleep was troubled by the image of ferris the next morning there was great astonishment in the court of the fairies at seeing the gallery so richly decorated and the bushel measure full of beautiful pearls they had hoped to punish the young princesses their cruelty was disappointed they found each alone in her little chamber after consulting together again in order to devise some tasks which could not possibly be accomplished they told the sirs to go to the seashore and write on the sand with express orders to take care that what she wrote there could never be effaced and they commanded fairer to go to the foot of mount adventurous to fly to the top and bring them a vase full of the water of immortality for this purpose they gave her a quantity of feathers and wax in hopes that by making wings for herself she might perish like another icarus de Sures and fairer looked at each other on hearing these dreadful commands and embracing tenderly they separated as if taking an eternal farewell the fairies conducted one to the seashore and the other to the foot of mount adventurous when fairer was left by herself she took the feathers and wax and made some vain attempts to form wings with them after having worked for some time most ineffectually her thoughts reverted to ferris if you loved me said she you would come to my assistance hardly had she finished the last word when she saw him stand before her looking a thousand times more beautiful than on the preceding night the full light of day was an advantage to him do you doubt my affection said he is anything difficult to him who loves you he then requested her to take off some portion of her dress and having kissed her hand as a recompense he transformed himself suddenly to an eagle she was rather sorry to see so charming a person thus metamorphosed but placing himself at her feet he extended his wings and made her easily comprehend his design reclining upon him she encircled his proud neck with her beautiful arms and he rose with her gently into the air it would be difficult to say which was the most gratified she at escaping death in the execution of the order given her or he at being permitted to bear such a precious burden he carried her gently to the summit of the mountain where she heard an harmonious concert warbled by a thousand birds that came to render homage to the divine bird which bore her the top of this mountain was a flowery plain surrounded by fine cedars in the midst of which was a little stream whose silvery waves rolled over golden sand strewn with brilliant diamonds fairer than a fairy knelt down and first of all took some of this precious water in her hand and drank it after this she filled her vase and turning towards her eagle said ah how i wish that the sirs had some of this water scarcely had she spoken these words than the eagle flew down took one of the slippers of fairer and returning with it filled it with water and carried it to the seashore where the princess de Sures was occupied in fruitless attempts to write indelibly on the sand the eagle returned to fairer and resumed his beautiful burden alas said she what is de Sures doing take me to her he obeyed they found her still writing and as fast as she wrote a wave came and effaced what she had written what cruelty said the princess to fairer to command what it is impossible to accomplish i imagine from the strange mode of your conveyance that you have succeeded fairer alighted and moved by the misfortune of her companion she turned towards her lover and thus addressed him give me proof of your omnipotence or rather of my love interrupted the prince resuming his proper form de Sures, observing the beauty and grace of his person cast on him a look of surprise and delight fair coloured and by a movement over which she had no control placed herself before him so as to hide him from her companion do as you are told continued she with a charming air of uneasiness ferris knew his happiness and wishing to terminate as speedily as possible her trouble read said he and disappeared swifter than a flash of lightning end of section sixteen section seventeen of four and twenty fairy tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information 
or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen fairer than a fairy by mademoiselle de la force translated by james blanche part two at the same instant a wave broke at the feet of fairer and in retiring left behind a brazen tablet as firmly fixed in the sand as if it had been there from all eternity and would remain immovable to the end of the world as she looked at it she perceived letters forming on it deeply engraved which composed these lines the vows of common love in sand are traced and even graved in brass may be effaced but those which are inspired by your bright eyes in starry words are written in the skies naught can destroy those characters divine eternal as the heavens in which they shine i understand cried de Sirs. he who loves you must always love how well your charming swain expresses his feelings she then embraced fairer than a fairy who soon in her arms recovered from the confusion occasioned by the little feeling of jealousy she had experienced and confessed it to her friend who accused her of it and both confirmed in their friendship abandoned themselves to the pleasure of an agreeable and affectionate conversation queen nabot sent messengers to the foot of the mountain to find what was become of fairer than a fairy they found the scattered feathers and a part of her clothes and consequently believed she had been dashed to pieces as they desired full of this idea the fairies ran to the seashore they exclaimed at the sight of the brazen tablet and were overwhelmed at perceiving the two princesses calmly seated in conversation on a jutting piece of rock they called to them fairer presented her vase full of the water of immortality and laughed in secret with de Sirs at the fury of the fairies the queen was not to be jested with she knew that a power as great as her own must have assisted them and her rage increased to such a pitch that without hesitating an instant she determined on effecting their ruin by a final and most cruel trial de Sirs was condemned to go on the morrow to the fair of time to fetch the rouge of youth and fairer than a fairy to proceed to the wood of wonders and capture the hind with silver feet the princess de Sirs was conducted to a vast plain at the end of which was an immense building divided into galleries full of shops so superb that no comparison could be found for them but in the recollections of the magnificent entertainments at marley these shops were kept by young and agreeable fairies assisted by their favoured lovers as soon as de Sirs appeared her charms fascinated everybody she took possession of all hearts in the first shop she entered she excited much commiseration by asking for the rouge of youth none would tell her where to find it because when it was not a fairy who came in search of it it was a sure sign of torment to the person who was charged with this dangerous commission the good fairies told de Sirs to return and to inquire no further for what she sought she was so beautiful that they ran before her wherever she went in order to gaze at her her ill luck however led her to the shop of a wicked fairy hardly had she asked for the rouge of youth on the part of the queen of the fairies than darting a terrible glance at her she told her that she had it and that she would give it her the next morning and ordered her to enter a room and wait till it was prepared for her they led her into a dark and pestilential place where she could not see her hand before her she was overcome with terror ah she exclaimed charming lover of fairer than a fairy haste to my rescue or i am lost but he was deaf to her appeal or unable to act as he had done in other places de Sirs tormented herself half the night and slept the remainder when she was awakened by a good-looking girl who brought her a little food telling her that it was sent her by the favourite of the fairy her mistress who was resolved to assist her and that it would be fortunate for her if such were the case because the fairy had sent for an evil spirit who by breathing on her face would make her hideous and in that frightful state she would be ignominiously sent back to the queen of the fairies who with all her court would triumph in her misfortunes 
the princess de Sures felt frightened to death at this threat of losing in a moment all her beauty and wished rather to die outright her agony was horrible she groped about her dark prison in vain hope of discovering some mode of escape when some one took her by the arm and she felt in her heart a sensation of pleasure she was gently led towards a spot where she began to perceive a little light and when her eyes became accustomed to it she was struck by the appearance of what was to her the most charming object in the world for she recognized that dear prince who loved her so truly and from whom they had separated her on the eve of her wedding her transport her delight was extreme is it you she exclaimed a hundred times at length when fully persuaded of the fact and forgetting all her own troubles but are you the favorite of this wretched fairy she continued is it with this fine title that i again behold you undoubtedly replied he and we shall owe it to the end of our troubles and the certainty of our happiness he then recounted to her how in despair at her being carried off he had gone to seek a wise old man who had informed him where she was and assured him that he would never recover her but in the kingdom of the fairies that he had furnished him with the means of finding it but that he had been arrested in his pursuit of her by this cruel fairy who had fallen in love with him that following the advice of the sage he had dissembled and by his docility had obtained such an influence over her that he had the care of all her treasure and was the minister of all her power that she had just departed on a journey of six thousand leagues that she would not return for twelve days and that therefore they should lose no time in escaping that he was going into his cabinet to fetch a part of the gem of the ring of gyges that she should put it on and thereby becoming invisible she could pass anywhere as for himself he could show himself as he pleased do not forget said she the rouge of youth i wish to put some on and to give some to one of my companions the prince smiled whither shall we go continued she to the queen of the fairies he replied no that will never do she exclaimed we shall perish there the sage who counselled me pursued he told me to lead you back to the place from whence you came last if i wish to be assured of happiness he has never yet deceived me in anything whatever well then so be it said de Sures. we will go there the prince brought her a valuable box in which was the rouge of youth and with the hope of making herself appear more beautiful still in the eyes of her lover she rubbed some hastily all over her face forgetting that she was invisible by means of the gem which he had given her she took him by the arm they traversed in this manner the whole of the fair and were soon close to the palace of the queen there the prince resumed the gem of gyges the beautiful de Sures became visible and he became invisible to the great regret of the princess whom he took by the arm in his turn and presented her before nabat and her court all the fairies looked at each other in excessive astonishment at seeing de Sures return with the rouge of youth and the queen frowning awfully desired them to guard her strictly our arts are vain said she we must put her to death without trying any more experiments the sentence was pronounced de Sures trembled with fear her lover reassured her as much as he could but we must return to fairer than a fairy they had conducted her to the wood of wonders and here is the reason why they had condemned her to chase the silver-footed hind once upon a time there had been a queen of the fairies who had succeeded in due course to that grand title she was beautiful good and wise she had had several lovers whose affections and attentions had however been lost upon her entirely occupied in protecting virtue she found no amusement in listening to the sighs of her adorers there was one whom her coldness rendered the most unhappy because he loved her better than any of the others one day seeing that he could not move her to pity him he protested in his despair that he would kill himself she was not affected even at this threat considering it merely as one of those extravagances in which lovers sometimes indulge but which never have any serious result 
however some time after he really did throw himself into the sea a sage who had brought up this young man complained to the supreme authorities and the insensible fairy was condemned to do penance for her severity in the form of a hind for the term of one hundred years unless an accomplished beauty could be found who by venturing to hunt her for ten days in the wood of wonders could take her and restore her to her original shape forty years had already elapsed since she had been first transformed at the commencement of her penance several beauties had risked the trial of this fine adventure from which so much honour was to be derived each hoped to be the fortunate huntress but as they lost themselves in the pursuit and at the end of ten days were no more heard of this ardour began to cool and for some time past no beauty had voluntarily offered herself those who had recently undertaken the task being condemned to it by the fairies in order to ensure their destruction it was thus to get rid of fairer that they led her to the wood of wonders they gave her a small portion of food for form's sake and placed in her hand a silken cord with a running noose to catch the deer that was all her outfit for the chase she deposited what they gave her at the foot of a tree and when she found herself alone she cast a look round this vast forest in the profound silence and solitude of which she saw nothing but despair she was anxious to remain at the skirt of the forest and not to enter it too far so in order to know the spot again she placed a mark at the point from which she started but alas how did she deceive herself every one lost themselves in this forest without being able to issue from it in one of the paths she caught sight of the silver-footed hind walking slowly she approached it with her silken cord in her hand thinking to take it but the deer feeling itself pursued started off at full speed stopping from time to time and turning its head towards fairer they were in sight of each other all day without being any nearer at last night separated them the poor huntress was very tired and very hungry but she no longer knew where to find the little provision she had had given her and there was nothing but the hard ground for her to repose upon she lay down therefore very sadly under a tree she could not sleep for a long time she was frightened the least thing alarmed her a leaf shaken by the wind made her tremble in this miserable state she turned her thoughts on her lover and called him several times but finding him fail her in her great distress she exclaimed with tears in her eyes ferris ferris you have abandoned me she was just dropping asleep when she felt a movement beneath her and it seemed to her as though she was in the best bed in the world she slept soundly for a considerable time without any interruption she was awoke in the morning by the song of a thousand nightingales and turning her beautiful eyes around she found she was raised two feet from the earth the turf having sprung up under her lovely form and thus made a delicious couch a large orange tree threw its branches over her like a tent and she was covered with flowers by her side were two turtle doves who announced to her by their love for each other what she might hope for with ferris the ground was entirely covered with strawberries and all sorts of excellent fruits she ate of them and found herself as well satisfied and as much strengthened by them as though they had been the richest and best kind of meats a stream which flowed close by served to allay her thirst oh ye tender cares of my lover cried she when she had refreshed herself how much i needed you i murmur no longer give me less dearest and let me see you she would have continued in this strain had she not perceived stretched close to her the silver-footed hind quietly gazing at her she thought this time she must catch it with one hand she held out to it a bunch of grass and with the other grasped the cord but the deer bounded lightly away and when it had gone a short distance it stopped and looked back at her it kept up this game all day another night came and passed like the one before it she awoke under similar circumstances and four days and nights elapsed in the like manner at length on the fifth morning fairer than a fairy on opening her eyes thought she saw a light more brilliant than that of day when she perceived in those of her lover seated near her all the affection with which she had inspired him he fervently kissed one of her feet 
his presence and this respectful action gratified her greatly you are there then said she if i have not beheld you all these days i have at all events received the proofs of your goodness say of my love fairer than a fairy replied he my mother suspects that it is i who assist you she has placed me in confinement i have escaped a moment by means of a fairy of my acquaintance adieu i came only to encourage you you shall see me this evening and if fortune smiles to-morrow we shall be happy he departed and she hunted again all day when night came she perceived near her a little light which sufficed to show her her lover here is my illuminated wand said he place it before you and go without fear wherever it will lead you where it stops you will perceive a great heap of dry leaves set fire to it enter the place you will see and you will find the skin of a beast burn it the stars our friends will do the rest adieu fairer than a fairy would have desired far more ample instructions but seeing there was no remedy she placed the wand before her which showed her the way she followed it nearly two hours very much vexed at doing nothing else it stopped at last and there truly enough she perceived a large heap of dried leaves to which she did not fail to set fire the light was soon so great that she could see a very high mountain in which she observed an opening half hid by brambles she separated them with her wand and entered a dark hole but soon after she found herself in a vast saloon of admirable architecture and lighted with numberless lamps but what struck her with the greatest astonishment was the sight of the skins of several wild and terrible beasts hung on golden hooks which at first she mistook for the beasts themselves she turned away her eyes with horror and they were arrested in the centre of the saloon by the sight of a beautiful palm-tree upon one of the branches of which was suspended the skin of the hind with the silver feet fairer than a fairy was enchanted at seeing it and taking it down with the aid of her wand she carried it quickly to the fire which she had lighted at the entrance of the cavern it was consumed in a moment and re-entering joyfully the saloon she penetrated into several magnificent apartments she stopped in one where she saw several couches placed upon persian carpets and one more beautiful than the rest under a canopy of cloth of gold but she had not much time to contemplate arrangements which appeared to her singular for she heard hearty peals of laughter and several persons in loud conversation fairer than a fairy turned her steps in the direction from which the sounds proceeded and entered a wonderful place where she found fifteen young ladies of celestial beauty she did not surprise them lest she was surprised herself the extreme loveliness of her appearance took away their breath and a deep silence succeeded to cries of admiration but one of these beautiful persons more beautiful than all the rest advanced with a smiling air towards our charming princess you are my deliverer said she addressing her i cannot doubt it no one can enter here who is not clothed in the skin of one of the beasts which you saw at the entrance of the cavern that has been the fate of all these beautiful persons whom you see with me after ten days of useless pursuit of me they were changed into so many animals during the day but at night we resume our human forms and you charming princess if you had not delivered me would have been changed into a white rabbit a white rabbit exclaimed fairer ah madam it is indeed better that i should preserve my ordinary form and that so wonderful a person as you should be no longer a deer you have restored us all to liberty replied the fairy let us now pass the rest of the night as joyously as may be and to-morrow we will go to the palace and fill all the court with astonishment it is impossible to express the joy which resounded in this charming spot and the delight which all these young persons felt at the sweet sensation of finding themselves once more in the land of the living so to speak they were all still of the same age as when they commenced their unfortunate chase in the wood of wonders and the eldest was not yet twenty the fairy desired to take three or four hours repose she made fairer lie down beside her and relate her adventures she did so with so touching a voice her discourse was so unaffected and so full of truth 
that she engaged the fairy without reserve to assist her love and render her happy she did not forget to speak to her of de Sirs, and the fairy was immediately interested in her favor they went to sleep after a long conversation which they had agreeably interrupted from time to time by the interchange of affectionate caresses the next day they all set out for the palace wishing pleasantly to surprise the fairies they quitted without regret the wood of wonders and quickly arrived at the palace as they approached the inner court they heard a thousand melodious sounds which composed an excellent concert here is a fete going on said the fairy we have arrived apropos and advancing they found the court filled with an incredible number of people the fairy caused the gate to be opened and entered with her train the first persons who recognized her uttered the loudest exclamations of delight and the cause of this great joy was quickly made known to the multitude but on advancing the fairy was struck by a strange spectacle she saw a young girl more lovely than the graces and with the form of venus bound to a stake near a pile of wood where apparently she was about to be burnt to death fairer than a fairy uttered a loud cry as she recognized de Sirs, but she was much astonished when at the same moment she lost sight of her and a young man appeared in her place so handsome and so well made that one might never be tired of looking at him at this sight fairer uttered a still louder cry and running towards him without any regard to appearances she flung herself on his neck exclaiming a thousand times it is my brother it is my brother it was her brother who was also the fortunate lover of princess de Sirs, and who fearing they would put her to death had given her the gem of gyges to rescue her from the cruelty of queen nabot and by doing so became himself visible the brother and sister lavished a hundred caresses on each other the invisible de Sirs added hers and her voice was heard although she was not to be seen whilst the fairies in unparalleled astonishment expressed in every variety of manner their rapture at again beholding their virtuous queen the good fairies came and threw themselves at her feet kissing her hand and her garments some wept some were unable to speak each testified her joy according to her peculiar character the bad fairies the partisans of nabot also pretended to be delighted and policy gave an air of sincerity to their hypocritical demonstrations nabot herself in despair at this return controlled herself with an art of which she alone was capable she offered at once to resign her power to the rightful sovereign who with a grave and majestic air demanded of her why the young girl whom she had seen bound to the stake merited such a punishment and since when they had been accustomed to celebrate a cruel execution by fates and sports nabot excused herself very lamely and the queen listened impatiently when the lover of de Sirs spoke thus they punished this princess said he because she is too amiable they torment for the same reason the princess my sister they were both born as handsome as you now behold them he then begged his lady love to cover up the gem of gyges and she immediately appeared again the sirs charmed all who saw her they are beautiful pursued he they possess a thousand virtues which they do not derive from the fairies that is why they are rousted up to persecute them what injustice to tyrannize over all those whose charms do not emanate from yourselves the prince paused the queen turned towards the assembly with an agreeable air i demand said she that these three persons shall be given up to me they shall enjoy the most happy fate that can fall to the lot of mortals i owe much to the fairer than a fairy and she shall be rewarded for the service she has done me by uninterrupted felicity you shall continue to reign madam added she turning to nabot this empire is sufficiently large for you and me go to the beautiful islands which belong to you leave me your son i will share my power with him and i will marry him to fairer than a fairy this union will reconcile us to one another nabot was enraged at all these decisions of the queen but it was of no use to complain she was not the strongest she had but to obey she was about to do so with a bad grace when the beautiful ferris arrived followed by a gallant train of youths who composed his court he came to pay his homage to the queen and manifest his joy at her return but in passing he cast a look at fairer than a fairy 
and made her comprehend by his passionate glances that she was the first object of his devotion the queen embraced him and presented him to fairer begging him to accept her at her hands there is no need to say he obeyed joyfully exclaiming with transport o oh, love for all my tender care and aid by this rich guerdon i am overpaid the two marriages were celebrated on the same day both couples were so happy that tis said they are the only pairs who have ever really gained the golden vine and that those who have been since named as having done so are purely fabulous personages thus innocence triumphs over the misfortunes with which it is assailed envy and jealousy only serve to increase its lustre and often the justice of heaven renders its possessors happier for the trials they have undergone there is a providence which watches over the conduct of mortals and delights in rewarding the worthy even in this world End of section seventeen.